Welcome to the sixth episode of the Open Score Conversations podcast. I'm so excited to be sharing this conversation with Dr. Kensley Beale with you. Dr. Beale is a superwoman. Her journey from being an injured clarinetist to becoming a thriving musician's health researcher who is also a consultant, educator, podcaster, and journalist. Wow. She has a fiery passion with helping musicians, educators, and institutions better understand and establish healthier environments and support systems for musicians. In this episode, Dr. Beal provides many insights and tools for helping musicians and doctors communicate better. She also addresses how post-secondary educations can better support their musicians, and also some parallels and mindset between gymnasts and musicians. There's so much in this podcast, you are going to love all the tips and resources that she has to provide for all of us musicians. Thank you so much, Dr. Kensley Beal, for joining me on this chat. Um, I'm really, really excited because the route that you have taken with your career in your life was one possible route that I also wanted to go for. So it's just so nice to see that this like performance arts and medicine community starting to come in on Instagram and on socials and it's like the community I would have wanted to dream about when I was back in university and also injured and like having no resources so thank you so much for the work that you're doing yeah thank you so much for having me I'm so excited to share my story and hopefully some resources for other musicians who may be struggling with injuries or teachers who may have students who are struggling and don't really know where to turn. Yeah, I want to wonder if it's okay with you. We start off a little bit more on the vulnerable side <laughs> because one of the biggest things I think our classical music community and musician community needs is just being open with our story about being injured because it was, at least back in my day, it was a little bit on the bit of the taboo side, but there's so much research out there, like the one in 1980 with one of the biggest ones for the orchestral musicians. 82% of them were injured. 76, I think it was like, it's kind of debilitating for their work. So we're not alone, but then not a lot of people are talking about this. So I share my story about how I was injured back in uh, university a lot when I'm like also on podcasts. Would it be okay if you can share your story um, going through all the surgeries that you've had and your path and how you came into performance medicine? Yeah, absolutely. And I love the idea of being vulnerable. And I think that that's a key part of like my business and my research because in my presentations that I give, I, you know, I give the big statistics that 98% struggle with performance anxiety and the 82% have musculoskeletal problems and musicians are four times more at risk of developing hearing problems. And then I follow it up by saying, it's really easy to hear these statistics, even the 98% struggle with performance anxiety and still feel alone and still feel like, well, no one experiences it like me or no one understands what I'm going through. And so I actually do an anonymous exercise with people so that they're able to see like in their own community who is struggling so that they don't have to really reveal themselves that they don't want to, but they still understand that the people in their community also are struggling. So, so where it sort of started for me was I go back to my solo debut when I was 18 with the Jacksonville Symphony Orchestra. And I just, I so vividly remember standing on the stage thinking like, this is what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Like I'm going to be a professional clarinetist and I'm going to, my, my goal was to get principal clarinet in the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. Like I wanted to be Laura, like that was my, (laughs) that was my goal. And I went to Florida State University and college was obviously more demanding than my high school, you know, goals and curriculum. And so I was practicing more and I started developing this nasal air leak and it's called stress velopharyngeal insufficiency, which is just kind of an obnoxiously long group of words. that means that my soft palate didn't function properly. And my teachers were immensely supportive, but they also said, you know, we don't really know exactly what this is and, but you have to get it fixed because this is going to derail your career. And there's a lot of literature in the field that says people who struggle with SVPI, stress velopharyngeal insufficiency are embarrassed or that they won't win auditions because the nasal air leak is so distracting. So I think my clarinet professors were quite wise in saying, hey, you have to get this fixed because your career may not be able to move along as quickly as you would want it to. 
The problem is <laughs> it took me two years to get a diagnosis. And I really owe a lot of it to my mom who spent hours and hours on Google, Googling like nasal air leak and air leaking out of your nose while playing the clarinet until she sort of hit the right, you know, algorithm. And we were able to find a doctor to do some scans. And so I had to have scopes and scans, which were not the most fun thing I've ever been through in my life. And they found that I actually had an anatomical problem. So something that I had had from birth that can develop as cleft palate. So where you're missing part of your lip, but for me, it was inside of my mouth and it didn't affect my daily life, but it did affect me when I was playing clarinet, because when you're playing a wind instrument, the intraoral pressure can be up to 30 times greater than that of normal speech. So when I was working on really hard articulated passages, like Mendelssohn, which was the death of me, <laughs> then, you know, like the air would come rushing out of my nose. And so I ended up going through surgery. And at the time there were less than 20 case studies of people having to have surgery for this. And the doctor was like, well, I don't really know if this is going to work. I, you know, do the surgery for children. Mm. I don't know if you're going to be able to return to play. And so I was really stuck at this crossroads between, okay, do I get the surgery and maybe be able to return to playing or do I not get the surgery? And my teachers are telling me, Hey, I'm probably not going to be able to move like in, into a, pro a prominent role that I would want. Seems like a lose-lose situation. <laughs> it was, it was, it must have been terrifying. It was, I mean, at 20, like I was terrified, but I also felt like it was the right thing to do. And as we'll like go through the rest of my story, it very much was the right thing to do because it sort of changed the trajectory of my life. But the, so I went through the surgery and then I came out of surgery with a British accent. <laughs> and <laughs> this is, this is the thing that was the key factor in changing my life because the, it wasn't a neurological problem. It was that there was so much scar tissue mm. on the inside of my mouth that I couldn't produce what's called a post-vocalic R, which is an R following a vowel. So if you have the word jar, J-A-R, A is the vowel, so that R. So I sounded British, <laughs> which was kind of cool for a little bit of time um, until people like keep asking you where you are from and you're like, I cannot explain this story one more time. <laughs> So I had to go through speech therapy to recorrect it. So I sound like an American again. And that process is what opened me up to the world of performing arts health and performing arts med medicine. And really was the, it was the key point that changed from being like, mm, I'm not sure I want to do clarinet full-time anymore to, I think I want to help other musicians have easier access to good resources and how to prevent injuries in the first place. Mm -hmm. Wow. That is a crazy story. And, and just I, uh, yeah, crazy. Cause for me, when I had my injury, it was mainly like tendonitis, maybe some thoracic outlet syndrome. Cause you know how everything's all connected, but to have to go through the surgeries and really like decide on what you want to do with your life but also not sure what the risks are uh, must have been really stressful too so props to your mom for helping you out because my mom did the same thing you know while I was trying to practice she'd be googling <laughs> yeah mom, moms are heroes they definitely are I'm not a clarinetist myself and maybe some of the listeners are also um, not clarinetists so I was wondering if you can go in a little bit more deeply about how um, what a struggle it would be to play clarinet, but lose half your air and, and some of the difficulties that come along with that. Sure. So, I mean, air is the, the key foundation to everything about being, um, being a wind player. And it, if you're using your air properly, you can have beautiful tone and articulate more efficiently and, you know, a myriad of other things. So when you're losing part of your air, well, you can't articulate for me particularly it was articulation I just couldn't articulate as quickly as I needed to um to win jobs and then the other thing is actually having air and that pressure come out your nose for me was particularly painful mm. so and then you deal with the other aspect of it being distracting so several of the woodwind musicians that I've worked with who have SVPI talk about in their recital 
they actually got distracted because the air took them out of their zone. So I think there are sort of several different aspects of having this air leak that cause problems for wind musicians. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And the fact that it's painful is also something that needs to be addressed. And I'm wondering, because also with my journey, is there a vocabulary that can be built between musicians and medical healthcare professionals that can kind of bridge the gap in making communication easier for both of us to work together? Because back when I had my injury too, that that was a little bit of a gap and it made it difficult for just both of us to really come to an empathetic conclusion as to how to move forward. Absolutely. So one of the things that the physicians that I work with more closely now talk about is there's sort of a problem on both sides. So one, a lot of medical provider providers who don't understand what the musician practice schedule and performance schedule is like, and that a lot of people are freelancers and they cannot just take a break. And the doctor's saying, well, you just have to rest. And they're like, but I we can. need to eat as well. <laughs> yeah. Like, what? Okay. What else do you have for me? Um, so the the medical side needs to be a little bit more informed about what our job entails and be creative and finding solutions to help us continue to play and heal at the same time, if at all possible. And then on the musician side, I think things that will help expedite that process is understanding that a musician's injury is often multifactorial. And there's a model for this that's called the biopsychosocial model. And it's one that I teach a lot, which, which says that there are biological factors like age and gender that play into our injuries. So we know that For example, women tend to struggle more with injuries, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then there's the psychological factor, which is like trauma and beliefs and anxiety. And then there's the social factors. How is our culture impacting our ability to get help? And you talked at the top of the podcast about stigmas. And so that's, you know, a social and cultural aspect that could affect us getting help. One for clarinetists specifically is the use of neck straps. So the second most prominent place for clarinetists to get injuries is in their right hand and wrist area. Well, that's because the clarinet sits here. So it makes a lot of sense. It's a constant point of contact. We also know that neck straps alleviate the amount of force on the right hand and wrist. But a lot of clarinetists or band directors will tell students, oh, well, that's not cool. Or clarinetists don't need it. That's wimpy, which is totally incorrect. I do not hold to this belief at no. all. You should use Don't listen to that, people. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's an example of a social factor. So I think when musicians are able to understand all of the aspects that come into play with their injury, and they can explain that concisely to the medical professional, it will help expedite the process because in the U.S., you may get maybe 15 minutes with a medical provider. They don't have the time to go through like all the different aspects. So if you're able to say, hey, I'm a clarinetist and I also work in an office job, which means I'm utilizing the same muscles on the on the computer that I am while playing the clarinet. I think that this is a contributing factor. What can I do? Okay, well, that just gave them a lot more information a lot more quickly, <laughs> you yes. know? Yeah, I think it's really important for musicians to be able to tell the just physicians like what their lifestyle is like, how important it is, and also how to like describe their pain. Sometimes when I'm talking to other musicians and they're telling me like, oh, you know, this part hurts, my arm hurts. And so I'll often ask them like, well, what does it feel like? Why? Otherwise, if you just say, oh, it hurts, like we, there's nothing much we can do. So what is some vocabulary that musicians can have to describe pain so they can also recognize it for themselves and also be able to tell if it's like, is it just growth discomfort or is it actually an injury? Yeah, I love the wording that you just used. It's it's one that I I utilize all the time. So is it growth discomfort or is it pain? So growth discomfort might be something like tiredness, fatigue, soreness. I talk a lot about professional athletes or maybe a musician, if you've gone to the gym and you've worked on a muscle group that you're not used to, you may be sore or maybe your muscle gets tired. Well, that means you should stop for the day. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to go see medical, go seek medical help, right? Mm -hmm. 
versus if you're having stabbing, shooting, numbness, tingling. These are signs that there is something actively wrong. You need to stop and you need to go seek medical care. And it may be something that's really easily fixable. Like maybe you have a muscle that's compressing a nerve and you just need some massage therapy to help or some, maybe some dry needling to retrain that muscle so it's not going to compress that nerve. And if you catch it early enough, then you're not going to have to have a really severe intervention. And so I, I agree that understanding those vocabulary words and what that actually indicates is going on in your body will also go a long way for prevention in musicians' health. Yes, definitely. And I love how we're starting to kind of creep in a little bit to kind of education um, because I know that you do a lot of consulting, a lot of coaching in implementing, um, I guess, programs into universities on how to educate not only musicians, but educators and, and everybody involved on injury prevention. So can you talk a little bit about that and also maybe into musculoskeletal and injuries as to what that is, and then maybe use that as a jumping off platform? Absolutely. Um, so musculoskeletal injuries would be anything in the like muscle, bone, tendon, any part of that aspect of our bodies, the physical body that is not functioning the way it should. And that can be for many, many different reasons. Um, I actually went to a seminar at the Performing Arts Medical Association Conference earlier this year, and the doctor was talking about how the majority of musicians come into her with hand pain and they say, I have carpal tunnel. <laughs> and most of the time they don't actually have carpal tunnel. It's something else that's going on. And so the... Performing Arts Medical Association and the National Association of Schools of Music, which is the accrediting body for schools of music in the United States. <laughs> that's a mouthful. I'm oh, sorry, that was that's a mouthful. <laughs> they sort of came together and created these standards for that musicians needed to understand more about their health, to be informed about musculoskeletal hearing, vocal health, and injury prevention. And I wish that they actually listed mental health in that list. It says like, it's not limited to these. So I would say mental health is like loosely included if you <laughs> understand that, but I wish that they actually spelled that I out. Agree. But they are very unspecific in how this information has to be disseminated or shared with the students, faculty, and students staff in the program. And so what has happened is you have some universities on the far end of the spectrum who have medical professionals on site and they have classes and trainings and yoga and all of this wonderful information. Although it's still not getting to all of the students, faculty and staff, it's kind of those who are just interested in it. And then you have this way other end of the spectrum down here, which is like they post a PDF on their website and call it a day. And I think it's really interesting. And I, I'd love to have a conversation with people at the accrediting body someday about, well, if music, if you think music theory is really critical to the development of a musician and you require them to take four semesters of music theory and it still doesn't stick with a lot of people. And I can tell you it doesn't stick <laughs> because when people go for their masters, they have to take an entrance exam on music theory and a lot of people fail it. I am included in that list. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you have to go through, you know, all of those trainings and people still need more time to understand the basics, then why is it acceptable for people to post a PDF about musician's health? What, like, why do we not have mandated training and why do we not have people with PhDs in every school teaching all the faculty, all the students, all the staffs, the, just the basics, the vocabulary, how to know what's wrong, how to find help at your university. And so this is sort of where I come in because as you mentioned, I do a lot of consulting with universities. And I have consulted with the National Institute of Health through the National Networks of Library Medicine. I have a training coming up with them on hearing health. And I sort of feel like this has been left to the individual teachers, right, to take this on and say, oh, my student has an injury. I need to figure out what's going on. Teachers don't have time. They do not have any more time to do this. They are not getting paid more to do this. 
And so I have a couple of different options depending on the school's budget where they can pay me to come in and consult, or they can pay me and come in and do one lecture. Or I have an option where the students get a really, really severely discounted rate to get access to this information. It's the cost of an etude book. Wow. And then you can, the teachers can implement this musician's health information into their existing studio or into their classroom. So they don't actually have to do any more work. They actually get more time back Yay. because they don't have to plan for classes. This is sort of where we are in the musician's health academic community is there are a few of us who are consulting and are helping, but I, I dream of and envision a world where the, the institutions themselves are actually taking this material and going even further and producing research. Yeah, I think it's so important that there are these courses or just everyone being educated to a higher degree on this injury prevention. And I would like to kind of go in a little bit more deeply on your dream of like having this implemented in the academic setting. In your ideal world, if it was fully flourished, what would that look like for you? So I want to jump back a little bit into sure. my gymnastics career to tell you how and why I envision this in music. So when I was at the University of Michigan, I was washing dishes and I actually sliced my finger open <laughs> and wasn't able to play for a lot of the first <laughs> semester. And so I was like looking for other jobs and there was this Olympian I really wanted to meet. And I thought, well, the best way to meet him is to volunteer for their team. And so I went to volunteer for their team and they were like, well, we don't have any volunteer positions open, but we have a paid position. So I, you know, through this long series of events, like <laughs> ended up working with the men's gymnastics team and then volunteering with USA Gymnastics and then going and covering world and Olympic level gymnastics all over the world. But when I was working with the team, I, I was like, these, they have access to dry needling and they have doctors on speed dial and they have nutritionists and they have psychologists and they have injury prevention and massage weekly massages men's gymnastics loses money for the university of michigan and basically every university men's gymnastics loses university <laughs> meanwhile our music department was over here putting on sold out full-fledged you know opera productions and musical theater productions and symphony concerts and we had like a yoga class that we could pay to take. Now to University of Michigan's credit, I will say they have done significantly more since I since I left and they do have a physical therapist for musicians now. So I oh, like they, they're doing wonderfully, but but they're still behind, like the access given to musicians is still significantly behind the medical access and resources given to athletes who are losing money for the university. Mm -hmm. And so this really got my brain thinking about, okay, well, how do we implement this? And so I'm going to give a simplified version and there's a lot more hoops to jump through. And I understand that, but the sort of the basic idea that I have is if you take a university like Florida state university that has a thousand music students and you do a fee that has, it's a $50 fee for every student or a hundred dollars or even two hundred dollar student fees like have you looked at how much money university students spend on fees on things that they never use mm -hmm. okay and explain to them okay here is how insurance works here's how much a deductible is your deductible is probably somewhere between like two and five thousand dollars but and you'll probably spend like $200 on a physical therapy appointment or a doctor appointment each time you go. So if you have this one-time fee and we're able to have an in-house physical therapist and an in-house physician for you, it will actually save you money. And so if you can explain it in those terms and you can have someone on site, then I think we'll start to see a lot more progress. Another way I think this could happen is having athletic training requirements be that you have to spend a semester with marching band. So, right, athletic training students, they have to spend semesters with different 
teams to get their hours under their belt. Well, marching band is a sport. I don't care what anyone says. It's absolutely a sport and they have injuries too. And so I would love to see as part of like the credentialing program for athletic trainers that marching band could be included in their, in their hours. And so then you, they're getting hands-on experience with performing artists and the performing artists are getting like, I don't know, how would you say it? Like getting better access to medical care in a way that's maybe destigmatized. Yeah, I totally agree with you on how much support people in sports have in terms of the medical, like, you know, the backing to just make sure that they're healthy and musicians or athletes too, of the little small muscles. And we're kind of uneducated about this. We don't get a chance to speak about it and then we don't get the support. So you wonder why all of us are basically injured in some way, shape or form. Yeah, and with the US medical system, unless you have a family who's really well off or unless you are extraordinarily poor and are able to be on state funding where the state will covers and the state funding really only covers very very basic things so that even a lot of times doesn't even cover all the care that you need but most musicians are in neither camp like they kind of make just enough money to not be in state funding and they're definitely not rich so they're working with the insurance company and they don't have the ability to pay and you know our UNT, the university I got my PhD from, they used to have free access to the medical doctors on our campus for musicians. And then I think it went up to like $25 for each session. And they were like, oh, well, it's not that much money. And my colleague was like, well, but if they're in a minimum wage job, that's three and a half hours of work that they have to work to get one session. Well, not much can be fixed in one session. So like, think about the, you have to think about it in those terms. So maybe $25 doesn't sound like a lot to some people, but if you're a student working a minimum wage job, that's a lot of time. And so you're weighing like the risk benefit reward thing. And it might even be that after you work three hours at that job and you go and get that session, it gets undone (laughs) as you try to work three hours to get that (laughs) session again. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, there you go. One thing that I'm also really interested in is like the parallels between an athlete's mind and a musician's mind in terms of like how we look at practice, how we look at injury, how we're tuning into our body. So as someone who has close contact with gymnastics and was also a musician and is also working with musicians, what are some parallels that you have seen between athletes and musicians? I think one of the most common ones is that uh, there's a belief in working longer, not smarter. I just, I remember being in school and people would be like, well, I'm practicing four hours a day. And the next person will be like, well, I'm practicing six hours a day. And there's, so I work almost exclusively with gymnasts and we have a lot of the same problems where young athletes are working 40 hours a week. And then an athlete uh, named Sean Johnson, she's an Olympic gold medalist from 2008 came along and she was working out like 20 hours a week and she was winning the world championships. Now, like leading up right into the Olympics, she did increase her hours. And we see similar things with Simone Biles. Um, The last I had heard is she was not in the gym 40 hours a week and was having a social life and enjoying other parts of life. And so there are these athletes who are creeping in who are saying, you know, you don't have to do it this way and you can work more effectively. And in college gymnastics, it's college athletes are capped at their amount of hours that they're allowed to work out. I think it's around 20 hours. um, And they're still performing at really high levels. And so I wonder if we sort of brought this idea to music (laughs) that was like teaching people that you don't have to brag about how little sleep you got and you don't have to brag about how many hours that you're working like just work efficiently for you and that will look a little bit different person to person but maybe yeah working more efficiently so I think that's one of the most common mindsets other ones would be uh, performance anxiety for sure um and This brings me to one of my favorite topics, which is the difference between anxiety and arousal. So 
There are some theories that describe performance anxiety as being either facilitative or debilitative. So either helpful or not helpful. But there is a more emerging idea that because in the diagnostic, the DSM-5, anxiety is only a negative thing. Like anxiety is a debilitative disorder. So you can't have a debilitative disorder be facilitative. Like that doesn't make sense. And so there's this idea of using different terminology in which that energy before performance. So if it's debilitative, it's anxiety. If it's helpful or facilitative, it's arousal. And so one of the examples I like to use is in gymnastics, because, you know, that's, that's my area <laughs> of world. So like, if you're on a balance beam, right, if you're on a 10 centimeter balance beam, and you have these nerves, or this energy, it's probably not very helpful, and it would be debilitative. If you move over to vault, though, having more energy can be turned into more power, which can equal more height and more distance, and then therefore a better score. And the same thing is true for musicians. Have and Has anyone listening or have you specifically had a really technical piece and you had this energy beforehand and maybe leading up in the practice sessions, you've actually never been able to play it up to tempo, but you get to that performance and you have that extra rush, rush of energy and it helps you actually play it better Yes, more times than I'd like to admit. (laughs) (laughs) So So that would be like facilitative arousal. And I think that athletes are given that vocabulary more often than musicians are given that vocabulary of, hey, actually this energy doesn't have to be bad because we're conditioned to be like, at the age of four, they're like, are you nervous? Are you nervous? Are you nervous? And so that like, that like gets in your brain. It does. (laughs) Is there a way for musicians to be able to maybe tell when their body's a little bit like the butterflies and then be able to get in a mindset where it's like, okay, this might be anxiety. It's starting to like funnel me down. Is there a way Mm -hmm. that we can go, oh, how can I use this to my advantage and have it become an arousal and help them perform better? Yeah. So one of the tools that I think is most effective is visualization. Um, So examples of, and I'm so glad you asked this question because so often we think of performance anxiety as like maybe the shaking or the butterfly in the stomach, but it can be so many other factors. It can be negative thoughts ahead of time. Like I'm going to fail. It can be Um, having an upset stomach, like maybe you're running to the toilet, you know, right beforehand, that actually is a symptom of maybe performance anxiety, Um, having sweaty palms or or sweating or increased heart rate. Any of these things can be symptoms of performance anxiety. So it doesn't have to look the same for everyone. But I think that it's really critical to understand that you, your, your brain is really powerful and it's also simultaneously very susceptible. So you can tell your brain and, and work through trainings to, to reframe those negative thoughts as I am excited to perform. I am going to do positive things. And there are different tools you can use, like tapping, you can there's um, like pressure points in the body and you can say, you know, I am going to perform well. I'm going to, and under the eyes and on the shoulders and the collarbones, and you can repeat that. Um, If you've had really debilitative negative experiences, you can use a tool called EMDR. I think it's high movement rapid desensitization is I think what it stands for. And that is a really powerful tool to help people retrain. So maybe if you were really young and you went to the bathroom on stage or you know if you had a huge memory slip and that has just stayed with you and you need to overcome it to move forward EMDR can be a really good tool to help you do that oh thank you for sharing all these because I'm sure that there are some musicians out there who can recognize like oh I'm anxious or I'm not but like I don't know what to do afterwards (laughs) you know like I feel this way now what and then just go on stage like hoping for the best so thank you for sharing that yeah, there's um there's one more tool that I think is really cool. And I'm gonna throw this idea out for because I'm sure there's like an engineer out there listening who can do something with this. But uh, the Royal College of Music in London has this really cool um system that they pre-recorded 
live people acting in different manners as an audience. So they can clap and they can cheer and they can boo and they can have cell phones go off and cough and sneeze and all these different things. And then there's a three person panel and they can nod along like things are going well, or they can say, oh, you know, don't call us, we'll call you. <laughs> and right. Um, and so they have this whole backstage area set up and they have someone like running this, um, I don't, this program, which I think has to be like the most fun job in the world. Like I would love to be the person who runs that one day. And so people can practice integrating these techniques in a backstage area and having a performance setting without it being maybe a performance setting that is more critical like an audition that they really want to win so they have they have a practice opportunity but i think that this simulation can be reproduced and should be implemented in every like college of music and every studio that there is so if someone has that sort of training to do a simulation i think that i think that that would be a really powerful tool for musicians i think so too and of much value because part of performing you know you have to practice being in that kind of performance state and mm -hmm. right now i feel anyways our only disposal towards that is actually doing that performance <laughs> and that audition and you can say like oh you know you can perform for friends or you can record yourself it like kind of gets you close to it but it's not enough to really be able to handle like the real deal so having some a simulation like that i believe was going to be so helpful mm -hmm. yeah yeah um, one thing I would also like to talk about and just kind of a little bit of a detour is when I was in university, we were talking a little bit about hearing health and how to um, prevent that, uh, any any hearing loss. And so we had like musician um, customizable, like, you know, I have to go into a doctor, get whole modes, uh, molds and you get the different like decibel degradation that you can get. Um, but I re remember seeing on a post that you had on social media or it was on your website where it said like, musician earplugs don't work. And I was like, ooh, this is really interesting. <laughs> so can you go into that? Yeah, I think, you know, saying musician earplugs don't work is a little clickbaity, but it is, it, it is was, actually, it <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's a, there's a lot of different facets to this. So we know that musicians are four times more likely to experience hearing loss than the normal population and are 50%, 57% more likely to have tinnitus or the ringing, ringing in the ear. And there are some very famous musicians who have talked about this, like Barbara Streisand, Will I Am, the rapper, and, and many others. And so to combat this, people were like, oh, we should just like shove things in our ears. And like, <laughs> obviously this will help. So on the most basic level, earplugs do reduce most earplugs reduce <laughs> decibel levels i'll give a caveat and we'll talk about that in a second um however they don't actually usually reduce the decibel levels at an at the even amount that they claim to across the board so a lot of the earplugs claim like oh you know you'll get the same sound quality um but it'll just be you know, reduced five decibels or 10 or 20 or whatever they claim. Well, okay. So musicians bought this and they were like, mm, I don't know about this. I don't think this is actually true. And, you know, other things that, that they found were maybe the earplugs were uncomfortable or it was really annoying because you have to constantly take them in and out, specifically if you're in a chamber setting, because maybe your chamber partner is telling you like, Hey, we're not blended. Or can you play this with more emotion or whatever, but you have to take the earplug out to actually hear that. And so a lot of musicians don't actually want to use them. So then, so that's one issue. So then you have these customizable earplugs that you're talking about, and these actually can be done really well, but you have to go to someone who knows how to work with musicians. Now for you as a pianist, this isn't actually such a big issue because you're not moving your jaw very much yours is not i would say most of the time in a pretty stable position would you say that's correct yeah that's correct like i'm not a vocalist that really needs to work on their jaw movements right so customizable earplugs fit your eardrums but the thing is your eardrum shape sort of moves with your jaw so if you're a vocalist or if you're a woodwind player that can actually be really painful now there are some audiologists who 
do this correctly, which is they have you move your jaw around while it's forming. So the, the earplug is able to work a little bit better for those type of musicians. Um, so that is just one thing to keep in mind. And then we have this other type of earplug and, um, uh, I will be careful about saying what it is, but <laughs> um, there is a musician's earplug that claims to reduce decibel levels 20 per uh, 20 decibels evenly. And there was research done at a lab in Texas that says that the decibel levels actually increase no. at low f- at low frequencies <laughs> when wearing this earplug. And what happened was, was this earplug used a testing protocol called the REAT testing protocol. And it tested seven like frequencies. Well, music is a lot more than seven frequencies. And it also didn't test low frequencies, which hello, like we have a lot of musicians who play instruments in low frequencies. So you would (laughs) think that this is maybe important. And so their testing protocol was inadequate for them to be able to claim that it tests 20, you know, lowers at 20 decibels across all frequencies. My colleague, Megan Taylor, who is just wonderful, it came up with this idea that I think is like sort of the perfect analogy, especially for you and any listeners you have that are pianists. And she said, it's like they had a piano tuner come in and tune seven notes on the piano and then just leave and be like, (laughs) okay, the piano is in tune. (laughs) And I'm like, I thought I feel like that's brilliant. It's a brilliant, it's a brilliant analogy. analogy. Yeah. Yeah. So all of this to say musician, like wearing earplugs, especially maybe in settings where you're at a concert, like listening, like maybe a rock concert or something of that nature is still important, but be aware and know the research that shows that it's not necessarily going to lower decibel levels equally like some of these specialized earplugs claim. It doesn't mean that using some form of hearing protection isn't important. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It, in, at the, in, the grand, in the grand scheme of things, you know, you have to do your due diligence and be like, you know, put some research into it, see how true it is. Um, and I'm hoping we can get better and better technology in the future that will help us as musicians. Yeah. And I, you know, this idea that the solution should be, well, just wear an earplug, I think is completely inadequate. And there are other factors. So there's a paper that describes like band directors as risk regulators. And I think it's a really interesting concept because if the band director isn't aware, it could be really easy to get the ensemble to get louder and louder and louder and louder without actually and utilizing the like softer dynamics and so i think that that's a really interesting thing so maybe also the band director could be responsible for programming so maybe you don't want to have like 1812 overture and a john mackey piece like on the same (laughs) concert because like maybe we, we need to give our ears a break so i think that's a really interesting concept Um, Another one could be that musicians themselves take some ownership. So think about an athlete. So if an athlete is going to have run a marathon, they're probably not going to do a large warm up in the days leading or like a large workout in the days leading up or even the morning of. So think about that for musicians. So if you know you have a long day of rehearsals, so maybe have the self-control to not be listening to music or listening to podcasts on your, in your earbuds at a high, at a high volume and give your ears a rest so that the decibel levels that you have for the day aren't expended too early. So I think that there's, you know, things from all different aspects that we can work on. So we need better earplugs for manufacturers. Um, We need, band directors to be and choir directors and orchestra directors to be more aware of their um their impact and then we also need the musicians themselves to think critically to say okay well what is my responsibility for my own hearing health and what can i personally do to limit my sound exposure throughout the day yes i totally agree with you in that at the end of the day there isn't one solution but everybody needs to basically level up on the whole health aspect (laughs) And uh, the faster that can come would be amazing. 
Yeah, absolutely. So before we close off, I am I do want to have the listeners know, and also before the sun starts to really get into your eyes, <laughs> for those who are not I'm watching, like hunching over here. Yeah, it's like I, we need to get you some sunglasses, you know. <laughs> I, well, I know. Well, I live in Colorado, so the sun is very vibrant here. So <laughs> so before that totally blinds you, um, I want to let listeners know oh that you also have a social media. You have um, the Musician's Health Lab. So can you explain what you do there and your experience on spreading more of this awareness to others through social media? Yeah, absolutely. So I finished my PhD in performing arts health. I am also a certified hearing conservationist, and so I have just taken all of the tools that I have at my disposal to make, my tagline is research made simple, because I think one of the biggest barriers for musicians is the academic jargon, or maybe not having, if you're not a university student, you basically don't have access to even read the research, like you have to pay between, you know, like 30 and $100 for one article. And so I have compiled this research into an easy to understand uh, deliverable format. So um, of course I have free options on my Instagram, which is at Kinsley Beal. And I'm sure it'll be like linked in the show notes. And then um, I have a free downloadable PDF on music performance anxiety and understanding why it happens and things that you can do to help alleviate music performance anxiety. So those are the free things that I offer. And then I have a training program called the Musician's Health Lab, and it is a year long program where you get um, access to classes all on musculoskeletal, vocal, hearing, and psychological health, as well as injury prevention and a whole bunch of other things, including burnout. And then you get biweekly uh, so two times a month uh, meetings with me to ask questions, especially if you have you are experiencing a problem or your student is experiencing a problem and you need just more direct access. So I have that, um, and then I have um, a consulting the consulting part of my business, which I go to universities and I help them understand what they can be doing better. And then finally, I have an access for uh, for univ- for university students because I think that funds shouldn't be a barrier to getting this information. So the way that works is uh, an educator or yeah, a studio professor contacts me and says, hey, I want to add this into my syllabus. And then I send them a payment link and it's $22 a student. Wow. So it's the cost of an etude book. And you can implement this in your classroom. All of the videos are pre-recorded. I have all of the deliverables done. So there's exercises, discussion questions, everything. And then this meets the NASM standard. It covers all of those basics. And then the students get the information like given to them in, in an easy to understand way so that they know how to prevent injuries and understand uh, some of the symptoms that happen if they are experiencing an injury. Wow, tons and tons of resources. Thank you (laughs) so much for providing that. So we know we can find you on Instagram. You also have your website. Is there other places that um, other people can contact you or do you have any upcoming projects that we should be on the lookout for? Yeah. Yes, I um, am also, my email is kensley at musicianshealthlab.com. If you really care about gymnastics, I have a Twitter that's Kinsley Ann, but it's like all like it it will bomb your Twitter feed with with everything to do with gymnastics. So if that's your interest, you can find me there. Um, Upcoming projects. Yes, I'm really excited about. um, I have a couple more podcast interviews coming out specifically on musicians burnout because that's what my dissertation was on. Mm -hmm. And then um, next week I have... um, a free s- seminar on musicians hearing health with the National Institute of Health that will be recorded on YouTube that you can find. Um, I have a couple other universities that have reached out to help me uh, have me design curriculum and come speak at their university. So just it's just sort of a wonderful time of life where I'm actually getting to help musicians understand about musician musicians health and which is my dream. So I'm I'm so happy. So if anyone has any questions, um, you can find me, like you said, on my email. You can find me on my contact form. I'm happy to help in any way I can. And I'll definitely put those down in the description in the show notes as well. So they'll all be there for everybody who is interested in just getting educated or also needs help. Definitely find Dr. Kensley. Thank you so much for your time. We touched through so many Thank things. Thank you. <laughs> and I would love to dive deeper in the future. So if you ever have time, I would love to have you back. 
Yes, I would love to come back. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. And pleasure having you. And I wish you the best on your upcoming sound check too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>